It's comforting to walk into a familiar chain restaurant, because you know you'll get roughly the same experience you're used to, no matter where you are, and because many of us have eaten more meals at the Olive Garden than we have with our grandparents. But while you may think you know everything about your favorite restaurant, there are some tasty tidbits about even the biggest chains that you've probably never heard. So today, we're going to take a look at some surprising facts about our favorite chain restaurants. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food Channel. After that, please leave a comment and let us know what other restaurants you would like to hear about. Okay, should we call ahead for a table or just show up? When Edna Morris was CEO of Red Lobster in the early 2000s, customers could walk into the restaurant to feast on an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet for the low, low price of $14.99. To drive in more sales and restaurant patrons, Morris added unlimited snow crab to the buffet list in 2003, but only raised the total dining cost to $22.99. The prices were so low, we're honestly shocked there are any fish left in the sea. And those low prices absolutely brought in more customers. Would you like some more? Thank you. <laughs> but they also came at a considerable cost to the seafood chain restaurant and the snow crab industry. As diners came in for the endless snow crab, they often passed on the other seafood options available in the buffet lines. Diners sat for hours peeling and eating crab legs to their heart's content, meaning that restaurants couldn't serve as many customers during operating hours. Snow crabs are imported, and government regulations ensure that the species is not over-harvested. Subsequently, the massive amounts of crab feet the chain purchased drove up market prices for the crustacean. Customers were happy, but Wall Street was not, and stock in Red Lobster dropped more than $405 million in value in just one week after the offer took place. Morris lost her job as the restaurant's books turned redder than the lobster on the sign. Celebrated for being a late-night haven for travelers and the hungover or possibly still drunk crowd, Waffle House has over 1,900 locations in 25 states, mostly in the South and Midwest. Waffle House is famous for two things, YouTube fistfights and basically never closing. In fact, Waffle House's dedication to being open through pretty much any kind of weather condition has actually led to the creation of an unofficial meteorological indicator called the Waffle House Index. Can you get that smothered and covered? According to AccuWeather, potential customers and local storm preppers can determine the weather's severity by how many Waffle Houses remain open. The term was officially coined in 2011 after a tornado in Joplin, Missouri ravaged the city, causing $2.8 billion worth of damage and claiming 158 lives. Throughout the event, however, both of the town's Waffle Houses remained open. Not even the post office would do that, and Kevin Costner made a whole movie about them. Where's our Waffle House movie, Kevin? The chain also has a reputation for efficiently handling weather disasters in areas conducive to hurricanes. In addition to having a limited menu that's resistant to power outages and food shortages, Waffle House has team members specifically designated to reopen locations as soon as it's safe. So the next time you're hurling a chair at a Waffle House employee, be sure to shout, thank you! International House of Pancakes, better known as IHOP to people who don't have to say every word in a restaurant's name, may be international, but it's only been fully national for just over a decade. Up until that point, it had locations in just 49 states. Oh, so close. The troublemaker was Vermont. Classic Vermont move. Vermont was the last U.S. state to finally welcome an IHOP, marking its place on the restaurant chain's map in 2009. So what was the holdup? Well, the state refused to serve IHOP syrup or anything that wasn't its own pure maple. And if you've ever had Vermont maple syrup, you know why that is. Franchise owner Sam Handy Jr. eventually petitioned IHOP to be able to make substitutions in the syrup department. He also asked for the freedom to comply with Vermont laws, stating that maple-flavored and artificial maple were illegal labels and couldn't be served at any state restaurant. They, uh, take syrup pretty seriously in Vermont. IHOP agreed, thereby completing its conquest of the continental U.S. and proving that Sam Handy was, in fact, pretty handy. Over the years, Olive Garden's advertising, marketing campaigns, and menu have repeatedly referred to the fact that the chain sends its chefs and managers to a prestigious-sounding cooking school called the Culinary Institute of Tuscany. People wondered if it was real or just an advertising gimmick. Technically speaking, the Culinary Institute of Tuscany does exist. What's in question is how much of a school it really is. 
Every winter, the Italian chain restaurant sends a selected group of managers to Reserva di Fasano in Tuscany. The real one, in Italy, not like Tuscany, Ohio or something like that. The property runs as a bed and breakfast during tourist season, but it's only open for Olive Garden guests over the winter. It boasts guest rooms, a restaurant, a pool, and a winery. All things that famously teach you how to cook. Once the managerial staff arrive, they use the restaurant as a makeshift cooking school. During coursework, managers learn about Italian cooking styles, spices, and fresh produce. Once the class is over, the Olive Garden staff is free to explore Tuscany. The company pays for everything. Managers still receive their regular salaries, and no one is required to take vacation time for their trip. The chain also gets pictures of its managers talking to the on-site chef. That way, they can promote the experience in commercials and in local newspapers once the managers return. So, is it real or just a gimmick? Well, is Olive Garden Italian food? In 1986, the movie Crocodile Dundee, starring Paul Hogan, became a blockbuster hit. It sparked a brief American love affair with Australian culture that primarily led to more Crocodile Dundee movies and somebody named Yahoo Sirius. It also inspired a group of capitalist friends to capitalize on the hype by opening an Aussie-themed restaurant just two years later in 1988. Aiming to create a casual atmosphere that served good food, Chris Sullivan, Bob Basham, Tim Gannon, and Trudy Cooper debuted the first Outback Steakhouse in Tampa. The quartet initially only intended to expand the restaurant to a half dozen locations, allowing them to make a decent living from their business venture. However, the concept took off so quickly that others in the restaurant industry began requesting to join the team by opening franchise locations. By 1991, Outback had expanded to 49 restaurants. Soon after, the friends opted to make the restaurant chain a public franchise opportunity, and it's been good days ever since. No matter which of the Cheesecake Factory's 209 locations you visit across 41 states and territories, you're guaranteed two things. A menu the size of a school directory, and a slice of decadent cheesecake made in only one of two locations. That's right, every cake sold by the Cheesecake Factory is brought in from off-site from one of two industrial bakeries that produce all that indulgence. One in Calabasas Hills, California, and one in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. In addition to offering baked goods at its restaurant locations, the Cheesecake Factory also utilizes the large bakeries for external retailers and distributors. Are we really that surprised that the Cheesecake Factory's cheesecakes are made in a factory? It's right there on the sign. When the guys who founded McDonald's needed a name for their restaurant, they used their own. And when the guys who founded Starbucks needed a name for their restaurant, they were really insistent on including a reference to Moby Dick. We made a whole episode about it. Check it out. But when founders Bill and TJ Palmer set out to open the first Applebee's in 1980, they looked to an unlikely and much less exciting place for name inspiration, the phone book. And after digging through the local white pages, they fell in love with the name Applebee, spelled with a Y at the end. But that name was already copyrighted, so the duo slightly changed the spelling and opted for Applebee's, with a double E instead. For those who've always wondered what the heck the theme of Applebee's is, the initial restaurant was based on a drugstore. The Palmers opened the original Atlanta, Georgia location with a full name of TJ Applebee's RX for Edibles and Elixirs. Can't believe that didn't catch on. Before earning its reputation as the family-friendly chain that answers the question, what if Guy Fieri was a building? TGI Fridays started out as one of the hottest singles bars in Manhattan's Upper East Side. Before perfume salesman Alan Stillman opened the bar in 1965, most neighborhood bars were centered around male clientele. Women weren't welcome to sit at bars, and those who dared to take a seat in one of the many Irish pubs that lined New York streets became immediately suspect. Still, the upcoming Manhattan neighborhood was a hotbed for single women as the airline industry blossomed and opened up job opportunities for flight attendants. Stillman recognized the chance to capitalize on the new market and opened Thank God It's Friday, designed to make young women feel comfortable in a bar's social setting. He hung Tiffany lamps inside, put up a red-striped awning, and painted the building baby blue, and offered burgers, cheap beers, and sugary cocktails. Stillman described the bar's early years as a big party and compared them to Cocktail, the 1988 movie where Tom Cruise juggles liquor bottles while bar patrons yell drink names at him. Stillman has even claimed that Cruise was playing him specifically, although the movie is based on a semi-autobiographical novel by Haywood Gould, so, uh, probably not. 
As the 1970s and 80s ushered in a decline of the singles bar concept, the Friday's leadership rebranded the place as a family-friendly chain restaurant to keep the business running. It's been decidedly less hot as a pickup spot ever since. Cracker Barrel sells a lot of, let's call it kitsch, in their restaurant's gift shops, and most of it has little to nothing to do with food. For example, they sling a lot of music. In fact, the chain often partners with country music artists to make exclusive albums just for its locations. Those include albums made by country stars like Alabama, Charlie Daniels, Alan Jackson, Alison Krauss, and Kenny Rogers. Okay, so nobody was exactly shocked when Kenny Rogers made a Cracker Barrel album, but the crowning jewel of their line has to be the album they made with country music legend Dolly Parton. Sold in the chain's old country stores and online, Parton's An Evening with Dolly Live hit gold with the Recording Industry Association of America in 2012. The down-home restaurant chain also released an exclusively sold Dolly's Backwoods Barbie Collector's Edition in 2008. Jolene never got her own Barbie doll. It's been a national restaurant chain for decades. But before Denny's swept the country, it was known to Lakewood, California residents as Danny's Donuts. In 1953, owners Harold Butler and Richard Jezik set out to provide their customers with good coffee, excellent service, and the best donuts 24 hours a day. The world called them mad. But the world was built by such madmen. The business did well, and soon the owners expanded with more locations and an extended menu, offering sandwiches and other entrees with their traditional donut fare. Eventually, Danny's Donuts became Danny's Coffee Shops. In 1961, the chain of 20 restaurants had become so popular that Butler changed the Danny to Denny's to avoid confusion with another popular chain, Coffee Dan's. Coffee Dan's may have won the naming battle, but it lost the war. The chain no longer exists. But as of August 2022, more than 1,460 Denny's operate in more than 970 cities in all 50 states. If you were ever within 15 feet of a TV or radio in the late 90s and early 2000s, you probably remember the Chili's Baby Back Ribs jingle. I want my baby back. Chili's Baby Back Ribs. I want my baby back. Chili's Baby Back Ribs. And now it's just gotten stuck in your head. If it's any consolation, you're not alone. In 2004, Ad Age named Chili's Baby Back Ribs jingle the song most likely to be stuck in your head. It became an instant success, making its way into an Austin Powers film and earning covers performed by NSYNC and Lewis Price of The Temptations. Ironically, despite the ditty's instant popularity, it was actually a last-ditch attempt by Guy Bomarito to save his ad agency. The memorable tune only took Bomarito five minutes to write, and he later admitted he had never even eaten Chili's baby back ribs. <laughs> you know, I haven't eaten one, you know, why start now? Good luck getting it out of your head, though. I love my baby, baby, baby back ribs. Oh, yeah. So what do you think? Which of these facts surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Weird History Food.